All right, welcome to How to DeFi by GSK Wealth Builders. It's going to be a series of taking you through the step by steps of decentralized finance. So I'm going to go from the beginning, uh, start with the history of why DeFi exists, and go all the way to you know where we are today, what kind of DApps, what kind of applications we can use, and how we can put decentralized finance applications in our life to earn better returns than what we're getting at our banks and brokerages. So I'm going to get started. Um, if you have any questions throughout the uh, throughout the presentation, just put them in the comments and then I can help um, update it on the next episodes or I can just do some reviews later on. So we're going to go ahead with the presentation. So episode one is going to be on centralized and decentralized finance, just getting an overview of DeFi. So the main topics I'm going to cover on this one is what is DeFi? traditional financial institutions, how the financial system is broken today, the DeFi solution, and a demo of a DeFi savings account versus a traditional bank account. So step one, what is DeFi? So DeFi is the acronym for decentralized finance, which refers to globally accessible financial services built on top of blockchains that run out automatically on codes and protocols without any central intermediaries. So in essence, De DeFi is programs that we've been using for hundreds of years, banking, services, investing, interest, and they've coded it to run automatically without humans. And by doing that, it's made the applications more efficient. It's taken out some inefficiencies and some biases that were in these systems, and there's no central intermediary, so they actually can't be shut down by governments. So the code or protocol specifies the resolution of every possible dispute and the users maintain control over their funds at all times. This reduces the cost associated with providing and using these products and allows for more frictionless and efficient financial systems. So then I just have uh, a few company names. You can screenshot this or take a picture and, and look up these companies. Some of them exist today. Some of them might not exist anymore. However, the, the majority of them exist. For example, under payments. Uh, I don't really use any of these payment protocols because I don't pay people in crypto, but I pay in stable coins, right? So when I pay in stable coins, I'll use DAI, I'll use U USD, I'll use USDC. It exchanges, when you go to exchanges, one inch exchange is an aggregation of all of the exchanges, but I primarily use Uniswap and pancake swap and then I don't do derivatives so that's some of the uh, DeFi applications that you can use right now um, and anywhere in the world so then KYC know your customer obviously the banks or the governments actually the government not the banks but the government wants to know that you're who you are you are who you are so these companies have been trying to be the provider for know your customer then you have prediction markets for people who like to, to bet and gamble. Wallets, MetaMask, I really like MetaMask and Trust Wallet, and Zerion has been changing the way you visualize finance. Then you have insurance coming into DeFi, which didn't exist when I started. And then you have lending, which is huge. Lending has about, I would say, $75 billion in total, um, total funds locked. So the beauty of DeFi is that anyone with a phone or PC and internet can have access to financial products. We're already seeing how DeFi could potentially disrupt traditional finance. So when you look at DeFi right now, this is just on the Ethereum blockchain. As of yesterday, April was April 11th or April 12th, $51 billion is locked in DeFi and 19% of that is in the application called Compound. And you can see they have an ad, they have a ad for MetaMask. So to shed light on why DeFi is exploding, we'll start by first going through the basics of how traditional financial institutions work. For simplicity, we'll focus on the highest leverage institutions in the traditional financial system, the banks, and we'll discuss its key areas to see the potential risks. So this is how to DeFi, the traditional financial institutions, part one. So the banks. So the bank's role in the world is to facilitate payments, accept deposits, and offer lines of credit. 
So that's what they've been doing for hundreds of years. The top 10 banks are valued at 2.3 trillion US dollars. The total market cap of the entire crypto market as of today was valued around 2 trillion US dollars. So DeFi has already, or crypto, not DeFi, has already reached the capitalization, the capitalization of the top 10 banks. So it's not small. Even though 1% of the world is using DeFi, there's a lot of money in DeFi or in crypto, I would say. So this is a list of the top 10 banks, right? So the first four of them are in China. And then you have JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, HSBC, and Mitsubishi. So that's what you got there for the banks. Now let's go. So what's the issue with banking right now? So according to, you know, internet users from the UK and the US, 43% of respondents said banking fees is the number one you know issue or frustration they have number two it can be time consuming you have to stay in line right when you line up to go to the bank uh, you have to call now for a lot of products and the, the, the lines for calling can be two to three hours and then bad customer service the banks are cutting off their customer service they're reducing the amount of people that work for them they're reducing the amount of people that are in the call centers they're reducing their hours and then you're just getting bottlenecked. So this is frustrations that people are having. But, you know, number one is they're getting feed to death. Everything costs a fee. And meanwhile, you'll see on TV net, you know, net profits breaking records every year. Right. So what DeFi, DeFi seeks to build a better financial landscape, making it possible by the advent of the Internet and blockchain technology, particularly in three key segments of the banking system. So DeFi is going to be focusing on payments and clearing accessibility and centralization and transparency transparency so the payment clearance system so there's a lack of local um, bank transfer options in canada for example canada has e-transfer e-transfer it works fairly well sometimes your transfers get lost and then you'll have to call them and it could take hours to get on the phone with somebody but they work very well in america there are no e-transfers right they're doing ach still so i'm guessing banks are writing checks and sending them to each other i know when i had to pay a contractor i had to send checks through my bank and it took weeks right so there's lack of the trans you know the transfer options when we're in the digital world there's lack of affordable glow and payment system options that's why we have paypal and square payments routinely get lost and take days they're expensive you know a wire can be 50 bucks and then it takes you know days and hours hours to days to get there Customers are not allowed to see the payment system. So you just trust them and wait and wait and wait, right? Then accessibility. So World Bank estimates 1.7 billion people are unbanked. More than half are from developing nations. The main reasons are due to poverty and lack of access, right? So geographical and geopolitical trust issues as well. If I put my money in the bank in a country in Africa, some of the people will say, don't do that because they might take your money or you might lose your money or they might scam you, right? So um, they have that issue. So two thirds of the 1.7 billion unbanked people have a phone though, right? So that's a solution right there. So then this is a heat map of the unbanked. You see the, the red dots with 200 million, you have a lot of China, you have a lot of Southeast Asia, you have Russia, Africa, South America, Mexico and a look at how met about between 10 and 100 million people in the United States are unbanked. So centralization and transparency. You have banks like Washington Mutual. They had 188 billion dollars in deposits. Lehman Brothers had 639 billion dollars in deposits. They just both failed in 2008. Over 500 bank failures in the US have happened and one of the centralized points of failure there is no way for a regular investor to know what these institutions are doing. So you're trusting them with your hard earned dollars, right? And then they're just going around and, and taking excess risks so they can make more money and losing your money. Right now, luckily we have insurance, but this should not be happening. So, you know, this is uh, in Greece. So the daily withdrawal limits wouldn't be enough to cover many basic necessities. What can I do with 60 euros? I owe 150 at the pharmacy. This is a person who in 08 had to line up every day to get their 60 euros, right? Their, the money was rationed off and it just caused chaos. 
Lehman Brothers, right? The fourth largest investment bank in America, bankrupt, 2008. Then you have new ones, right? New institutions. This isn't a bank, but Robin Hood's a trading. They were fined $65 million for completing trades that were less than optimal for their customers in exchange for fees, right? Costing their customers $34 million in lost equity. That's crazy, right? Because Robin Hood advertises themselves as they, you know, are for the people. And they've proved several times, allegedly, that they were for the people, right? Got to say allegedly. So then you have redlining, right? This is this racial tension. So the practice of refusing to lend money, give mortgages, or sell home insurance to people living in poor areas. So they would just pick areas in, in like in the neighborhoods, right? And they'd go to the red area and say, well, there, there's black people that live there. We're not gonna we're not gonna rent or we're not gonna give them mortgages. And if we do, it's gonna be high interest rates. We're not gonna sell them home insurance. So they actually can't get a mortgage without home insurance. And what happens is the property value goes down in those areas. Now, if you are sending your kids to public school, the public school is funded by the property taxes. If the values are down, the school doesn't have much funds. Therefore, they can't pay teachers and it just creates an endless cycle of poverty, right? And uh, even though redlining is gone, we haven't seen a recovery in these neighborhoods yet. Right. So then you have contract buying an exploited practice loan dominated by redlining where the mortgage system was absent. Right. So during the Great Migration, Southern black families moved to the northern cities to escape Jim Crow. Real estate speculators would sell them overpriced housing using contract buys. So they're doing like call options or put options. Right. And then the, it would mean that the black family would lose the house and all of the equity if they missed a single payment where we know in the financial system, if you don't pay uh, a mortgage, they don't just take your house after one single payment and kick you out, right? There's a process, there's a due process, the time to catch up, then there's a time to, to go to court and there's a time to settle these things. So contract buying was just prevalent in these neighborhoods and it's not fair, right? Now, what does that have to do with DeFi? Well, we have a long history of institutions breaching public trust. The profits to the institutions continue to break records. Services continue to decrease and cease to exist. Technology can reduce the effects of the bad actors and the policies, and DeFi is censorship resistant. So DeFi represents a movement that seeks to push borderless, censorship-free, and accessible financial products to all. DeFi protocols do not discriminate and levels the playing field for everyone. The one exception would be Ethereum gas fees. For someone with a little bit of money, they don't want to be acting on the Ethereum blockchain right now. They want to be on other blockchains like Matic or Polygon, Binance, things like that. But we'll get into that later. So how will it be different with DeFi? So DeFi protocols are built on top of public blockchains such as Ethereum, which are mostly open sourced for audit and transparency purposes. So because it's open sourced, if person A makes a product and they're gouging people, person B who also knows how to make this product might take the code, make it better and give it to everyone else. And then we'll all move our money to those funds, right? So you can't just charge 12% interest anymore. Someone else will charge six, someone else will charge three. You're seeing platforms charge 0.5% interest, right? So um, that's the great thing about DeFi is it's open sourced. They're usually governed by Decentral Autonomous Organization, a DAO, to ensure that everyone knows what is happening and that no bad actors can single-handedly make bad decisions. So you you can own a token, for example, in Uniswap, which is a, a trading protocol, and you can actually have a vote in the outcome of Uniswap. So that's how it works. So since DeFi protocols are written as lines of code, you can't cheat the code, right? The code does exactly what it's supposed to do and it treats everyone equally. Now, if the code has a flaw, and you're, it's exploited, that's what the code was supposed to do. So that's the risk that you take in DeFi is it's personal responsibility. You have to limit your risk. You can't just put all your eggs in one basket. So the codes run exactly as they're programmed to do and any flaws quickly become evident as it's open for public scrutiny. At the end of the day, DeFi's biggest strength is being able to cut out the intermediaries and operate with zero censorship. So decentralized finance versus traditional finance. It's unfortunate that not everyone is privileged to be banked in the current financial system. It's tough for the unbanked to compete with a level field. 
the DeFi movement is about bridging these gaps and making finance accessible to everyone. DeFi opens up opportunities and allows users various access to financial services without restriction on race, religion, age, nationality, or geography. So I'll just give an, an, an anecdote. Um, there's a really nice company in Canada called Constellation Software. They've averaged 42% per year return. In the last five years, they've been averaging about 25% per year return. The issue with Constellation is it's Canadian. So people in America have trouble trying to buy this Canadian uh, stock. They almost can't, right? And then the other issue in Canada is it's like seventeen or $1,800 a share. So someone who's getting started with a small amount of money, if they want to just put in $20 a month, well, they can't buy Constellation. So they have to buy inferior, well, not inferior, but lesser returning or lesser guaranteed investments, right? Now with DeFi, what you could do is you could actually fractionalize, like Bitcoin is $70,000, but you can buy one one thousandth of a Bitcoin. You can buy one millionth of a Bitcoin if you wanted, right? So that's the cool thing about DeFi. And it's going to, it's going to transfer into the finance world in the future. Right, so CFI, centralized finance and DeFi. Centralized finance on the left, right? So you're gonna have to trust someone and DeFi, it's a protocol, right? Centralized finance, you're sending your coins or you're sending your money somewhere and trusting them. DeFi, it's non-custodial, you're, you're maintaining control. DeFi is permissioned, which means there is a barrier to entry and they can stop you from acting. DeFi is permissionless. Anyone with a wallet, internet can, can access it. In CFI, you need to trust the people. In DeFi, you need to trust the code or the contract, right? So that's the main difference between DeFi and CFI. So now we're almost at the end. So I'm gonna do a demo of compound interest, which is just two slides, but it just shows the difference between centralized finance and regular bank interest rates and DeFi account interest rates. So right now, this is from April 2021. If you had $100,000 in savings, and you can change this by taking the zero off, right? So $10,000, uh, and then you'd make, you know, 50 bucks a year. So if you had $100,000 in savings, and you went to these 14 banks, on average, they're going to give you a 04 to 0.5% annual interest rate. So your $100,000, right? Or yeah, is going to make $500 a year. You're gonna need millions of dollars, right? Now, that's just how it is. There's no, you can't argue with them, you can't debate, you can't ask for different because everyone is offering the same thing. Now let's go to DeFi. This is just one person or one company. This company is called BlockFi, and there's a link to BlockFi in, in the bottom. But BlockFi, if you were to put US dollars in their account today in a coin, right? You they would pay you 8.6% interest. So now on that hundred dollars, right? We went back. A hundred dollars is earning you. A hundred thousand dollars is earning you five thousand five hundred dollars a year. You move it over to BlockFi and you buy USD coin. A hundred thousand dollars in savings is earning you eighty six hundred dollars a year. Seventeen times better return, right? Now how can they do that? BlockFi is lending to institutions um, to buy and trade cryptocurrency. They charge them fees. They can charge really nice fees because no one else lends and they give that return back to their people, right? Back to the holders. So this can make a huge difference in your life. Um, if you have three, $400,000 that you've saved up over your lifetime and you need to withdraw it every year, right? You can make $30,000 a year in just interest and that's very low risk. So that is how to DeFi and uh, traditional financial institutions part one. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, once again, um, please put a comment below. If you found this valuable, please like it and subscribe because I'm going to have quite a few other videos on DeFi. So the next thing I'm going to be showing you is what is DeFi continued. And that's all for today. So thank you.